Amen. 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 Let's prepare our hearts for the word of the Lord this morning. And this particular Sunday, I will, I, I may, oh, I do want to show that. Let's begin with a, a little video clip I found that I'd like to show. I almost forgot it. No, I did forget it. The video didn't give you a clue as to what I want to talk about this morning. This morning I want to talk about one true love. As the year began, we began first and foremost with one master. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. It was the example we found in scripture, but really it meant you cannot serve two masters and it doesn't matter what the other one is. Money, fame, fortune, pleasing others. Yeah, the list doesn't matter. You cannot serve God and, and we serve God first and foremost. One master. Then, two weeks ago, we talked about we have one purpose or one destiny. We have to have one purpose, one destiny as we embrace the new year to give the Lord, all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength to have one master and understand what our divine purpose is. Now, I want you to understand something. There's two things in that. Um, briefly, our divine purpose or our divine destiny, first and foremost, is to be the best believer we can be and show the love of God everywhere we go. When we do that, God unveils to us our individual purpose and destiny, our individual call, and not only what we're supposed to do because we're a believer, but what we're supposed to do because we are His. We have a personal destiny. This morning I'm going to talk about one true love. When I share this today, it should be something that I find lacking, but shouldn't be lacking. This should be the defining characteristic of Christianity. For this church, for the church corporately, 
And for each and every one of us, love should be the defining characteristic. This is the quality that separates us from everyone else, from all the religions, all the ideologies. We are about love, first and foremost. It's sad that that's not the world sees. As a matter of fact, I believe in my own heart that it grieves God that that's now not how the world sees Christians. Mm -hmm. But realize this. One time a teacher of the Lord approached Jesus and said, of all the commandments, which one is the most important? Mark 12, 29 and 30. He said, the most important one, Jesus answered, is this, here O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And I want you to understand something when we say that. I, I took a, a deep look at each of those four verses. It says, with all your heart. And it really means all your emotions. Your soul is the same word that we get the word psyche from. It's sukos in the Greek. And it really, it talks about loving God with your spirit. Your mind, well, that's self-explanatory, means we love him with our, our intellect, our thought process, our consciousness. And our strength is, it simply means we love him with our bodies, physically. Now, we do that in several ways. We bow before him in worship. We raise our hands in worship. But we also bend our knee and put our hand to the plow to service. Really, it simply says love God with everything you've got. Now, if you say that, nobody's going to argue with that. Most people say, yes, that's it. But Jesus, in verse 31, said something that's a challenge to all of us. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then he went on to say, even more in verse 32, love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on to say, there is no greater commandments than these. Love God, love your neighbor. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus taught a truth to us. That who is our neighbor? Everybody. Everybody. Everyone. That's right. Even the people you don't like. That's right. Jesus, later in John chapter 13, 30, verse 35, said this, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. And I love this. It doesn't say because you heal the sick, because you raise the dead, because you preach the best sermons. <laughs> it says because you love one another. The sad thing is many times as Christians, and especially in the Christian church, we make our identification with something else. You know, they'll know that you're, that you are my disciples by how you vote, how you judge, the way you set people straight straight on Twitter, I don't have that one, or even by your bumper stickers, by your boycotts, and on, and on, and on. There are many things that people do to attempt to signal that their virtue is different from the rest of the world, but it really comes down to this. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knoweth God. He that knoweth, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Now I want you to. He who loveth not, knoweth not God. Now, if you ever met a Christian that didn't really show a lot of love, that is for at least, the, the least thing you can call that is, oh, just lost the word, contradictory. Scripture says if you don't love, you don't know God. We're supposed to love God, we're supposed to love others. But sometimes we fail to grasp what it means to love others. And oftentimes, in a lot of Christendom, we think it's 
two different kinds of love. Have you ever heard anybody say, and I've been ashamed for a little while, you probably have, I love them with the love of the Lord. Now, I, I wish that were true, because nine out of ten times when people make that reference, it means, eh, I'm supposed to love them, so with God's love, I love them. Oh, that's great. I would, that wouldn't that be wonderful that everybody that ever said to you, sister, I love you with the love of the Lord. Brother, I love you with the love of the Lord. Wouldn't it be great if they really did? He gave his life for us. That is the most ridiculous platitude I've ever seen anybody ever use. You mean you, you die for me? Yeah, I didn't think you'd open the door for me. See, we think God wants us to give him pure, holy, altruistic, sacrificial love. So, long and short of it, see, God gets the name brand version. See, he gets green giant love. But everybody else we know, they get the stop and shop man. Or, if you're a shopper across the street over here, great value. Now, can you imagine thinking that? People would never say that. But it's actually what they're thinking. I give God the best love I have, and everybody else gets less. Jesus made it clear that the expression of our love for one another, our brotherly love, reflects directly on the extent of the love we have for God. It's spelled out in our text this morning, 1 John chapter 3. He says it clearly. Today we talk about these things. We've been talking about how to set our, our mind on the right things, how to have the right attitude, the right purpose, the right destiny, the right master. This morning, the right love, the one love, the one true love that's going to change everything. See, it's this love that will change the world. It did once before, it did, and many times after. We need to understand that if we want to see our world change, if we want to see our family change, if we want to see our neighborhood change, it begins with that one word, love. Love your neighbor as yourself. I'm going to talk about three things this morning. I tend to always talk about three things. But we're going to talk about three things this morning. And I'm not going to focus on loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because I believe I covered that really well on two weeks ago, when we, three weeks ago, when we talked about loving God as your first master, as your Lord. So this morning we're going to talk about brotherly love. And I want you to understand something. First and foremost, brotherly love necessitates that we have clear vision. We must, first and foremost, open our eyes to this one true love. And what that means is, first know that God says love is not a suggestion. It requires that we open our eyes to this one thing, that the love of God is non-negotiable in nature. It means we love one another. It was a command. This is my commandment, that you love one another. What? There is no but. In verse 11, he says, this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. John chapter 3, 13, verse 34, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. Uh, you know, I've listened to it before. Yeah, 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 I know. I'm supposed to love one another in theory. But in practice, it's okay to despise groups. Because they're terrible people. 
that's just not the point. It's not okay to despise one collective group of people or one specific person. Jesus said one another. It doesn't refer to only people that are identical to you. Only people that have the same kinds of opinions you have. He's talking about all mankind. Listen, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the Jews. Hey, you got a snicker out there? Uh, I left. <laughs> God so loved the world. And if the love of God is shed abroad and abides in our heart, we don't just love our family. And I got to tell you, there's an old Pentecostal thing. What is it? Uh, us four no more. I love, think I love my family. I love this world. I'm going to make it happen. That's it. That's never God's way. If your love cannot go beyond your immediate family, or maybe even your church family, or people that are of like mind, you are missing something. I dare to challenge you that you're, li you're missing intimacy with God. It's non-negotiable, and you need to open your eyes to this. Now, is love, is it good to open our eyes to it and say, well, God commanded me, i got to love? Well, my favorite example of that is my two daughters, when they were younger, had a, a disagreement. And my, my wife and I never let those things stand. We don't believe in it. I mean, you're going to have a problem with this. And when you see love as a command, you often think this way. And it's not what God's talking about. Now, I don't remember which children they were or I don't, but they were having a real um, struggle. And we turned to one of them, and I said, you need to tell your sister you love her. So one turns to the other and she goes, I love you! <laughs> That's what happens when you think love is just an act of obedience. It, there has to be more than that. It's not just a command. It's non-negotiable. Your eyes need to be open that you can't just shout it out. It has to be something you understand and feel. And it has to be the same kind of love that sent Christ to Calvary. It has to be the same kind of love that was shed abroad in your heart when you realize that God so loved you. He died. Is that easy to do? Yes and no. It's easy if you try to walk in the presence of God. You can go and witness and share your faith with the least of them. Is it easy? Not in our natural self. Because sometimes it's hard to love someone who hurt you, <coughs> taking advantage of you. It's hard to love someone who doesn't love you back. But again, we need to understand that what has to happen is it has to go beyond human love and be god breathed love in our lives. Scripture tells us that while we were yet sinners, God still loved us. Well, we hated him. I know it's easy to me to say he was God. Sometimes that idea of not love is they're simply giving pain. Their life is a shambles. They're falling apart. They need help. And they just don't know how to ask for it. The challenge there in loving one another is keep an open mind, open to those around us, and be sensitive to what you see going on, and do what you can. John says it this way in verse 17. 
If anyone, say that word, anyone. Anyone. What does that include? Everyone. Say me. Seize his brother in need. The word seize, it means your eyes are open. It means that you're paying attention to what's going on around you. Love is looking for the next opportunity to show love. That's what it is. Loving one another requires that we keep our eyes open. If anyone sees, number two, brotherly love involves action. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but in actions and truth. Love is expressed through the things we do. Sometimes we think if we feel bad enough about someone's problem, that's enough. We say something like, oh, brother, sister, I hate that you have to go through that. But I want you to know you're in my thoughts and prayers. And I really want you to understand something. Anybody ever been through anything? Did it really help you to know somebody else was thinking about you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. That doesn't really help me much. Uh, some people say it does. So I guess that's an okay thing. But it, it's not... If they're in our prayers and we're truly interceding on their behalf before the throne of God, that's a good thing and it's the right thing to do. But there's honest many times when we say, I'll pray about it, and you never, ever see God's face. When I hear of a need, I literally write it down, and I'm going to tell you why, because I forget. My life's busy, so if I don't write it down, I have a little book, if I don't write it down, I forget to pray for it. And I don't want to tell someone I'm praying for something and never do it. Because I don't want anybody to ever say that to me. But there are times when we just walk away. What I want you to understand, when people are going through a difficult time, of course we need to pray. Of course we need to meet their needs. But we need to be willing to do something to help get that prayer answered. You know, they don't, they don't who's in need of a job and pray that God will meet them? Yes, absolutely. Maybe you can make a phone call to yourself. Maybe because you know the right people. Maybe some way you can help out. If you know someone going through a health crisis, you can Pray for them because I believe that. But visit them too. Maybe bring them a book or a CD. Just something to lift them up and encourage them. I have been in situations where people told me they were going to lose their apartment. And the Holy Spirit said, do something about it. Do I always do it? Sometimes I cannot. But if it's within my ability and God leads me to do it, yes, I will. And it might mean, we'll talk about it in a minute, that it's a little hard for me for that month. And I might not ever know why. But I want you to understand that love is expressed by the things we do. Maybe a, a young couple is just, uh, I've been that way, married, two kids, three kids, four kids. Maybe you don't think you do much because of the stress in their life. You don't have any money, but you could say, can I watch the kids for a few hours? Do you go to the park or whatever you think you can do? I can tell you, young moms and dads would greatly appreciate that. My wife and I, we didn't really have that until Pastor Gail came along. We did everything. All her parents were in Pennsylvania, mine were dead, and I didn't trust anybody else. Until God put Pastor Gail in our lives. I'm sorry, I'm very, to say the least, I'm overprotective of my children, and I'm proud of it. And my children might say my dad was overprotective, but they will also be able to say I was not one of those statistics either. So, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any. Hey, you, you, I was that what they call them, helicopter parent. We're like SWAT team now. 
That's probably true. I went. To, I remember showing up. I showed up at school. I showed up at school when school was in session and walked by the door just to make sure they were in class. I. They said yes, you can go to the prom, and I followed the bus. I said I don't like the prom. I don't want you to go to the prom. I think it's just a. No, I went to, sorry, I went to the prom and I was the chaperone. And I actually, I went to the vice principal of the school and said, what do chaperones do? Because look at these people. This is absolutely unappropriate behavior in public. So we just make sure there's nobody killing each other, nobody smoking in the bathroom. So I walked up to Christina's best friend, boyfriend, and I smacked him in the back of the head. And I said, this is the dance floor. At least have the courtesy to get a room. So then they thought they were mocking me. I love this story. It had nothing to do with anything. I just love the story. So they thought they were mocking me. So every time I walked by, they danced like they were in like the 1950s. You know, enough room for the Holy Spirit in between and all that stuff. And they're going, yeah, they were making fun of you. I said, I don't care. I was happy. But yes. I was that kind of person because I love them that much. It's expressed in the things we do. Sometimes they say, well, I don't like it. I say, you'll love me later for it. I can tell you, I don't think they appreciated the fact that I was that kind of a parent. Now they understand it. Having their own children, they are probably just as much that kind of parent, and I'm proud of that fact. I'm not offended. I, I'm just a dad. It's not worth <laughs> yeah. Understand that it's what we need to do. It's an action. Jesus said that we're loved one another. He wasn't saying, I want you to have just feelings for them. He was saying, there are actions I want you to take. To paraphrase Forrest Gump's mother, love is as love does. The third thing I'll talk about this morning is brotherly loves involves a willingness or includes a willingness to sacrifice. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Sometimes. To show love to someone, you may have to sacrifice something yourself. I hope my son-in-law doesn't mind me to use him as an example. And only because I, I like, he's got great parents, so I think that's part of it. But anyway, I smile when you hear it. Not me. That's what it is. I'm sorry. Um, I'm trying to be. Discreet about it, but it was cold out. I watched. Um, they were recently, they were first married, and uh, we were all going out for dinner. And uh, Joseph and Christina, since they told who they were, simply said, I can't afford it this week. The bills are just too tight to the family and all that. And Anna, I said, don't worry about it, guys. I'll cover it for you. And then I talked to him later. I said, that was really nice of you. But he looks at me and says, that's OK. I just won't buy beer for a couple of weeks. Whatever his game was. Whatever it was he wanted to do, I said, I just won't buy that for the next few weeks. And he was willing to sacrifice because he wanted his family with him. He was willing to give up something that he valued because he loved them more. Sometimes you need to be willing to sacrifice. It means give a little. October 29, 20, 2009, a suicide bomber entered a women's campus in Islamabad International University. He shot the guard on duty and made his approach toward the cafeteria which was packed with hundreds of female students. The janitor on duty was a young man named Pervias Messiah. It was his first week on the job. His 
salary was less than $60 a month. He accepted the bomber in the doorway, prevented from him going in any further. The terrorists detonated his device, killing the janitor and three others. He never made it into the cafeteria. The damage would have been so much worse. The loss of life would have been in the hundreds. The twist on the story is Braveus was a Christian. In Pakistan, believers are a minority. They are traditionally among the poorest <coughs> of communities. But this man came to be considered a hero. He gave his life to save the lives of hundreds of female students. One professor said it this way. He rose above the barriers of caste, the creed of sectarian terrorism, despite being a Christian, he sacrificed to save the life of these Muslim girls. Now, while I understand exactly what it means, the words that bother me the most in there, despite the fact he was a Christian, but the reason he did it was not to despite the fact. It was because yeah. of the fact yeah. he was a Christian. He was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice of love for people he didn't even know. One of the students said a short time after, he's a legend to us. But as we look at it, it's a great story. Most of us will never, most likely, ever have to make such a sacrifice. Sometimes it might just mean we have to sacrifice the easy chair. It might mean we have to sacrifice the football game. Some of you uh, uh, would never do that. Super Bowl's coming up, so I know, fortunately it's in the evening, so it's not that big a deal. But I remember when I was uh, at another church before I became a pastor, and we had a Sunday evening service. And the weirdest thing happened on Sunday evening of the Super Bowl. All the men volunteered to work in the nursery. Because <laughs> <laughs> was the TV, right? You want to guess why? There was a TV. There was a TV in the nursery, <laughs> and it was long before cell phones that you could watch the game on. So they all volunteered. I stayed in the service. I didn't care that much. I love the Super Bowl game, especially when the Patriots are in it. But it doesn't come before I. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4 says this, do nothing out of self-exhibition or being conceived, but humbly consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only tend to your own interests, but also the interests of others. What he's saying is, in fact, what it looks like to love one another is to even give it up your own wants and desires on their behalf. Once when Jesus was speaking about the final judgment, he told a story about what would happen on that day. Listen to what he said. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom is prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick, you took after me. I was in prison, you visited me. And the righteous looked at him and said, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes or clothes you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the Lord replied, I tell you the truth. Whenever you did this for one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it. Now I'm going to tell you, this is Jesus speaking about our eternal reward. He's talking about the ultimate expression of love. And really what he's saying is the way to get into God's kingdom is to let the love of God in the world around him. John simply said, as you've heard from the beginning, we are to love one another. 
let our lives then be focused on expressing God's love in every opportunity. Before I pray this morning, I want you just to close your eyes and think for a moment. <coughs> self-sacrificing love that he gave to each and every one of us. If it sounds like an impossible goal, a task that's greater than you could ever accomplish, if you struggle loving the ordinary neighbor in the back, that weird uncle, sister pepperoni who doesn't understand what personal space is, brother pepperoni who could really, really use mouthwash. Begin by embracing God's love. Mindset that says, let that love be shed abroad in my heart, that I love others. Let's all stand this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is. set priorities. Lord, as we enter in to this coming year, let each and every one of us that are here this morning and those that may hear this message later, everywhere we go, reminding us to love. 